that uh, you know, although I enjoy the lake crystals uh, very much, I am uh, here in this uh, hall where you discuss the basics of lake crystals for, for the first time this week. Why? Because uh, there are so many other things uh, that are connected uh, right now or probably in the future to the science of uh, lake crystal that I simply cannot be at two, sometimes even three places at once. And uh, if you look through the program at the Isaac Newton Institute, you would notice that uh, uh, in uh, the group that uh, is uh, preoccupied with the uh, program called uh, Complex Fluids, uh, we have a lot of uh, talks with uh, uh, words such as active pneumatics in the title and uh, uh, there was a program for almost uh, six months now on the mathematics of lake crystals that uh, kept uh, dozens of uh, people busy at the Isaac Newton Institute. So basically it's very important to, to get as much knowledge about uh, your own field and the adjacent fields uh, uh, so that you can uh, find the way to progress uh, the science that uh, you are working with. And uh, I would like just to ask our panelists uh, to, to just discuss what, what is their opinion about the immediate or further down the road developments that you might expect in the field, in the field of lake crystals. But uh, in one sense that uh, let them think a little bit about uh, what they are going to say. <laughs> and uh, so we will have fun and quiz. Uh, that you would see on the on the screen. So there are some questions prepared. Uh, the first one: uh, How many independent uh, viscosity coefficients uh, would you need to characterize a uh, dynamic of the uniaxial dynamic? Ready? Check later who is attending. <laughs> On the 40 people vote, we have distributed 60 clickers. <laughs> <laughs> Pull it out of your pockets and uh, use them. Can you use the clicker? Same clicker twice. No. Okay, 41 so far. So I'll stop the system. <laughs> Just two. Okay, uh, so we, we need another day. Can, can we extend the <laughs> So, yeah, it's a pity that we didn't put six over there. I believe that, uh, <laughs> that would be another huge. But, uh, uh, but thank you. you. You need to study harder, really. <laughs> it just, uh, you know, it shows that there are so many new things to you in the field of liquid crystals. Okay, I'm not going to reveal the correct answer. They can find it in the textbooks. Textbooks are a good additional material for all the lectures that you're listening to. Uh, the next question. Uh, correct answer. If the disturbances are normal, large, that would be five. But uh, if the disturbances are kind of weak and the director distortions are very small, then you can uh, get away with three, basically. That's what Mizovic did. Uh, many years ago, in uh, early 30s, when in Krakow, huh? in Krakow, in Krakow, of course, yes. yeah, <laughs> um, which is right at the border with Ukraine. Yes. <laughs> it's a very good city, a very nice city. Okay, so now, um, where one can see the focal surfaces of Japan site. Pneumatic, biaxial pneumatic, smack decay, cholesterol, or smack decay and
Okay, let's hold it and move the answer. Only 40 volts. <coughs> so many people got discouraged by the original experience. <laughs> So, somebody really taught you the physics of defects and liquid crystal, that's very nice. So, the answer is smack decay and cholesterics, but uh, it should be clarified that only in cholesterics in which the pitch is much uh, smaller than the scale of deformations. And I believe that you've heard a lot about it from uh, one of uh, our panelists, uh, Professor Srinivasarao, today. Okay, very good. And now, uh, what would be the most important application of lake crystals in 30 years from now? So, okay, but now we have an opportunity to listen to what the experts in the field uh, know about the, the current status and what they think about the, the future of the festival. So, I, I presume you, you know already all the panelists because they were the speakers. Uh, uh, Slobodan, Zhuber, Ramin, Kolestanyan and uh, Mohan Srinivasarao. Uh, I will probably start with the person closest to me, Slobodan Zhuber. Uh, so, I'm not sure what exactly uh, to say at this moment, but uh, go, looking back in the history, I think we can learn a little what we can expect also in future. So, uh, at the beginning we say that uh, liquid crystals were around for more than 100 years, and then probably at least half of this period they were very interesting materials which were attracting attention just by observing nice textures and so on. But then, on the, on the next half, people started to, to run uh, some trials to make applications. Uh, like, uh, we have seen for a long period just the twisted cell, and that was uh, for a few years uh, there. And then slowly, uh, people with some persistence were seeing further and trying then to introduce that the colors could be also brought into this black and white uh, world and so the co color display was coming but again uh, it wouldn't probably evolve uh, much further if there wouldn't be simultaneously development also in this electronics so that the microelectronics developing the TFT uh, matrix uh, was helping to to push things further. And then uh, where, where things were going was certainly depending uh, partially on efforts because we had all, uh, obviously two competitions there between paraelectric uh, displays and uh, the magic display. And then obviously there was also one, uh, it's not clear which really uh, has the best physical properties probably where more efforts were there and perhaps the things were a little more robust things went through and developed to this practically dominant uh, display of uh, all uh, TVs and uh, screens uh, so that means that uh, 
if we can make any kind of extrapolation. So it's not particularly clear to say, okay, that will be, that will be. I think there are many, there are many ways where uh, things will uh, go, or perhaps will try to go, and then one of them, or perhaps several, will lead to more uh, our applications or more, uh, more effect on the society as well. Uh, but it's clear that uh, this will certainly not be just a pure material itself, but that definitely there will be a kind of uh, composite system where probably liquid crystal will be a part of this, and then the rest will be either solid or other liquid or gel or polymer or whatever. So that certainly uh, is the already a trend now. And which fields will this affect certainly Towards this direction, towards biological or biomimetic materials, is something what is going on, and probably there will be some intermixture between the real uh, life materials and the materials which will be artificial. So uh, perhaps uh, one could build in also some life parts, and, and this direction of in active materials is certainly uh, a step in this. Uh, first step, anyway. but not uh, definitely uh, clear direction where. Uh, then the other things are just applications in perhaps photonics or uh, optics, where certainly there are still uh, new possibilities. And uh, at least uh, what I see from uh, our research is uh, this topological, we call topological soft matter, where we have uh, this interplay of uh, very particular arrangement of defects, uh, perhaps of particles, or uh, complicated particles which can bring up some, let's say, more complex uh, feature of a composite system. So that I'm sure that there is still a playground, but perhaps also more than the playground to, to lead towards a component or to perhaps a small component in the beginning which can be used then uh, certainly sensors are some direction which uh, things can certainly go and we have seen that uh, there are some sensitivities there also we still don't understand yet what exactly it was in this particular cases which we heard about them but uh, I think that's some direction which uh, these sensors will certainly be then being templates for other materials either to to align them or to partially align or to structure or to uh, transmit some defect structure into something else and so on. So that's certainly another possibility where things will certainly go on. And uh, I think that would be for this moment what I said. And I know that you, you might have questions, but let's just uh, listen. Um all the opinions and then uh, we'll combine all the questions in one uh, open session. Okay, so uh, Professor Armin goes to him. Uh, so, um, I guess what I would uh, uh, focus on mostly is uh, when it comes to application, because I, I know this is what you uh, are more interested in, is uh, we are familiar with uh, this concept from equilibrium uh, situation in which Basically, the system has one, say, or a few minimum energy configurations. Um, if we design the system right, we will have these minimum energy configurations uh, the, way they, uh, the way we want them to be. And then uh, we are used to the idea when we want to engineer them, we would basically make them go from one uh, state to another one by, say, changing a parameter or a condition. Uh, but that also means that every time we want to have a change like that, we have to uh, actively uh, basically change these parameters so make the system go through these different states uh, as it were we are basically uh, taking them along these things uh, in my view this has very little uh, you know by just so okay so, so let me uh, take another view which is uh, you look at equilibrium systems, you either have a uniform uh, uh, phase when you have, say, a dilute solution of, of some molecule, or you mix two molecules and then uh, because of the 
interactions between them, you get the mixing and, and they phase separate into two uniform phases, macroscopic bulk phases that coexist, they will have an interface. Uh, if we engineer the system really, really carefully, maybe we will be able to get macroscopic coexistence of two or three or, or four or five, a finite number of these uh, phases, each of which being bulk and basically not having any interesting structure in them as their equilibrium uh, state. Now you look at something like the living cell, you see all these fine structures that dynamically form. If you put in numbers for the uh, volume fraction of what's inside the cell, you actually get this image that things are quite close to close packing in, inside the, uh, the living cell. So what you ex expect from this mixture of all these long polymers and sticky material is to get an entangled mess straight away. Um, and instead what we have is very dynamic structure, um, a structure that can generate basically spatial structure with, with really high resolution. You can get length scales, features at length scales that are very small and then they can disappear and go away somewhere else and, and create something else and so on. So it's very dynamic and it's, uh, it seems that it has almost something you could call serendipity. It, it's, the, it's the natural state of the system but it evolves in such a way that it will generate these things for you uh, without doing any extra work without going after the system. Um, and I think what we really need in engineering is something like that, something which if we understand the non-equilibrium state of the system, we could, you know, create something which we basically let, uh, you know, let it be on its own and it will generate all these different things on itself. All we need to do is design it properly uh, in the first place. Uh, and this is not science fiction because uh, basically if you if you, if you even start to study the non-equilibrium systems, uh, the first thing, for example, that he notices is not very difficult to engineer small features at given length scales. Active pneumatics, if you have heard the talk on active pneumatics last week, basically the first thing you get in a pneumatic liquid crystal as soon as you introduce activity is an instability which selects a length scale. So not only you liquefy, as it were, the, the, the state of the system, you, you make it more dynamic by adding the the stress, uh, the internal stress, which is basically uh, this effective uh, non-equilibrium driving force. But you also generate this dynamic length scale, which you can tune. So you will have all these patterns and the swirly patterns, uh, which dynamically forms at the, the length scale, which you can tune. Uh, then you can, you know, add more to the structure of the system and generate more dynamic uh, patterns and features and so on. So it, it's not you know, maybe we cannot make a living cell uh, straight away, but, but we can start to go to that direction. Uh, that's the, the, the first thing I would say. Uh, and also I would like to emphasize again the, uh, the sort of role of, of uh, taking a step back and, and thinking about things from a, from a fresh perspective. In fact, uh, in the example of, of this place that was mentioned, uh, I know, for example, the particular contribution by Wolfgang Helfrich, who was a theoretical physicist, you know, he was playing with his, with his things, uh, with his formulas, some of them quite complicated, horrible as the ones, uh, similar to the one which we saw today. And, and out of all that came, you know, the LCD, which you cannot live without. You know, all of us have many, many uh, copies of, of, of that display, which is, which is operating based on that theoretical concept. Um, someone like Casimir, who, who is known to mathematicians for developing very abstract uh, operators and, and, and mathematical concepts, spent uh, a, a good chunk of his uh, more sort of mature time at Philips lab, in fact, developing color TV uh, and, and, uh, and displays. Uh, and and I, I know that he, he was, uh, you know, he was not uh, shy of, of trying to introduce very radical revolutionary ideas. Uh, so, so if, if we just take things in, a, uh, in an incremental way uh, forward, I think we, we, we cannot really make the big changes. We, we should sometimes take a step back. And for me, active matter is uh, promising in the sense that you could shake things up and, and see interesting things in them and maybe you will take them uh, further. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mokhansin, what's our you know, I'm going to keep this very brief. So, uh, if you look back, as uh, Professor Zumer said, if you look back at history, 
and you look at what people said about what will be the future, they have almost always been wrong. <laughs> so I can cite the Hossein paper in 1925. Um, in, in it, if you read it very carefully, there is a statement, everything there is to be known about lithium crystals is known, there is nothing new. So that was in 1925. Um, a more recent example would be uh, home computers, right? So the, the CEO of IBM is known to have said there is a market for one computer at home. I have five at home. <laughs> So this was 1982 something. <coughs> and in terms of the display devices, uh, Jim Ferguson went to Polaroid, uh, IBM, um, Texas Instruments, and he was basically told, we will never use liquid crystal displays. We have our LEDs, now go home. <laughs> <laughs> All of these predictions are wrong. Have proven to be wrong. So all I'm going to say from a looking back at history is I have no predictions. Do whatever you find interesting. If it happens to be uh, liquid crystal materials that you find in biology, which is what fascinates me, uh, go after it. Um, um, there are materials, for example, that will not form liquid crystal cases if you have them as individual components, and I can provide you examples. Um, at any concentration, they will not form a liquid crystal. But you mix two of these at very exceptionally low concentrations, boom, all of a sudden you will get an incredibly fascinating liquid crystal sample. So these are um, things where you have uh, these molecules called cyclodextrin, for example, which is a byproduct of starch and you mix them with some dye molecule, you will invariably find liquid crystal cases. But no one actually knows what the hell they are, um, because most people don't study them. Um, and so, all I'm going to say is, don't look at me for predictions, just do what is fine. Thank you. Any questions? Yes? Okay, so not looking at Mohan. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one thing I don't recall hearing that may be a huge market, especially if you can find something other than the Scottish, would someone like to care uh, comment about photovoltaic possibilities? The Scottish can do it, but they're very difficult to align. Um, so getting into other sorts of crystals, the calumet and so on, does anybody see a um, possibility for photovoltaics being um, having a big uh, I, I will say something about it, even though you're not, <laughs> even though you're not looking at it. <laughs> Which is a good place to be, I think. Um, to the extent that I'm aware of that literature, uh, all the problems that we have worried about in terms of different crystals and alignments are essentially the same problems <laughs> for making organic electronics work, for making organic photovoltaics work, they all deal with interfaces. So if I were to say some place where we should focus our energies in terms of devices, I don't particularly care about devices, um, let me also tell you that, um, that's where I would focus my energy on. Uh, what do interfaces do to these materials? And in fact, if you can get these organic electronic molecules into the liquid crystalline phase, that might actually be very useful. But I don't see a whole lot of people doing that, although some do claim to do that. But fundamentally, the problems that, that have been of interest to uh, people in terms of interfaces with liquid crystals are essentially the same things that control charge transport. Uh, other questions? Well, you are thinking. You can disagree with me, though. Some questions no, from, the, from the students would be highly appreciated. Yes. Um, I was wondering um, if there are any places that you gentlemen have seen, or any aspects of liquid crystals, 
um, that you think should be used? Any places in technology where you think they would be really useful but aren't at the moment? Like, for instance, you might ask yourself, why aren't liquid crystals being used to answer a certain problem now? Or if someone isn't answering it with liquid crystals these days, do you think it would be useful to do so? <laughs> Clean bowls. <laughs> So basically all three of us, you know, you can consider us to be three stumps, right? Anybody know cricket here? <laughs> you guys have been here. What's up with this? So in any case, the whole idea for cricket is there are three stumps or wickets, right? So you're supposed to hit one of those stumps with the ball. And you toss the ball. And none of us batted that one. It hit the stumps. We are all out. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay, any other questions? So let me ask you a question. So how many of you sitting here, uh, especially the students, think that in 10 years from now, your professional job will be associated with Lake Crystal? So raise your hands. The panelists don't think so. <laughs> okay, but how many of you are pessimists in terms of liquid crystals' uh, future for you personally? How many of you think that your professional life would have nothing to do with the liquid crystals? Please raise your hands. Can, huh? you can choose different careers, maybe. Yeah, but, can but still, still you can liquid crystals. Okay, so you're kind of focused on my first year. Okay, thank you. So, so since uh, many of you raised the hands answering the first question, I, I ask you just use the opportunity because you will be gone from this place, uh, you know, in uh, three days, and you have no panel like this to ask questions. We'll be gone in twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, let me ask the, the, the following question from the three of you. What was the most unexpected development uh, over the past, whatever, five or ten years in the field of lake crystal that you were, were aware of? Just the surprise that it, I didn't expect. Okay, instead of letting Zoomer answer that question, I will answer it for him. <laughs> so <laughs> the thing that was most fascinating to me is these colloidal particles and liquid crystal and, and and doing topological stuff. So I don't want him to answer that yeah. way. It appears as if he would be promoting. So I will do that for him. I, I do really think that's, that's been really yeah, hard. Especially the experimental part, right. I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Anything else that comes to mind that kind of wasn't expected? I would think about this uh, blue phases, which were. Uh, was a nice example of what was before said, what people say. So mm -hmm. he, he, Frank had a very nice uh, saying that they are really just uh, a matter of uh, interest for some mathematicians and perhaps somebody who is interested in the world. Intellectual curiosity. Well, actually, uh, it was much stronger. He uh, said yeah, that it, they are completely useless. Yeah, useful. Oh, okay, yeah, that was the statement. Yeah. And then out of this, uh, um, after when people realize that there are ways to make special chemicals which can extend a wide range where the phase can be stable or that one can make some mixtures with polymers which can stabilize, things have turned and now immediately people start just to make even displays although they are not useful, uh, but definitely there was a complete turnaround. <laughs> it's a nice example of how people uh, shouldn't just uh, listen to uh, what we are saying or somebody else here. And try, uh, we must try to see some new ways, uh, some perhaps orthogonal to what we do. And not to think only liquid crystal it just means is this particular chemical. I think it just one of the material properties which goes 
uh, beyond the simple molecule, which is mostly or atom or what, which is mostly spherical, to something what has additional feature and is a step towards polymers and so on. And this feature becomes important in organizing the systems, whatever it is, can be called it also liquid crystal, molecular crystal, whatever, but that's something. And that, uh, in this way, I think it will follow many of you and us further on. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, um, I have a question about the display technology. Um, my first question is, um, was the, um, uh, what's it? the last 20 years, uh, was the biggest focus, has it been on, on display technology because of the commercial interest? Can you say that in general about the scientific field? That the most focus by, around the world was on display technology? Or applications for display technologies? I think for companies to make money, that was it. Yeah. But it's, uh, uh, one should stress that uh, in the last period of what, 10 or 20 years when industry was growing very strongly, I think there was not too much investment in liquid crystal research from the industry bank. Because they thought that practically things are solved. They just wait to put them out uh, step by step to catch new consumers and so on. Incremental. So, yeah, uh, and in some way, uh, they do small steps, no? but uh, perhaps not investing this, what is coming out of this uh, big selling, uh, back to the, this kind of science. So probably going in a broader area, but not, not directly back. Because yeah, I was wondering how, how much, yeah, what is the lifetime of liquid crystal displays? And of course, yeah, it's difficult to make predictions, but... Typically about one of the time that's true. But there's something else that, that's important, you know. So I have met a number of people from Samsung and LG because I spend a lot of time in Korea. Um, and it is actually quite remarkable. It is the same in the United States when Kevlar was discovered and made high, high strength fibers and you make bulletproof vests and things of that sort. All these industries have gotten rid of all the scientists who did all the work. And so what has happened is there are people who know how to make the product, but they have no idea what the hell they're making. And it is true, I think, today, I'm sorry to say this, in, in many places where there are people who couldn't tell you whether the material is isotropic or whether it is homeotropic. Because optically they look the same if you look at it under polarized light microscopy. And this is, this is just absolutely frightening. And, and so while the, the industry may move on, you, you still need people who have the knowledge for these things. Right? So. Thank you. Any, any other questions? OK, you put, uh, from you, then one question will be for you. <laughs> So I remember I was in an undergraduate school and uh, our philosophy teacher told us that uh, you know, the sciences are converging and at the end of the road, the, the, the only science that we will have will be called history. So this is the question uh, related to the... Uh, okay, if you still have questions to the panelists, uh, please ask them uh, now. <laughs> because we are approaching the closing time of this meeting. And you want to probably something to say, right?
So you should leave this up at the board then. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I guess that's uh, it. Thank you very much. Thank you, our panelists. For